Wildwood is a complete effort to carry on the legacy of Merv Wilkinson, to become the education facility that he envisioned, and we are carrying on that tradition, inviting universities, students, the public, the world to come and learn about sustainable ecoforestry and why it's important to know this now. We're just going to go grab some plants for people. Merv was a very engaging, lively personality, uh, loved to talk and tell stories, and so yeah, it was always a kind of a fun and interesting time. The crazy stories of the beaver coming in the house and how he would grab the beaver by the tail and, and take him back out to the back out to where it belonged in the lake. He treated the trees as friends. He walked the property on an ongoing basis and he came to know each and every tree on the property. And so he would know instinctively which trees then he could harvest and which ones he needed to maintain in order to, to regenerate the forest. It was revolutionary in many ways compared with these vast, large-scale clear cuts where everything was just taken down, whether it was used or not big trees, little trees, anything there was more or less just cut away and then a new forest planted. Well, Merv never planted a forest tree at all because he kept the biggest, the best trees, the, the ones that were producing seeds, really healthy trees, and they were the ones to grow into the new seedlings that then succeeded the big forest trees. All of our native evergreens with the exception of you, are edible. You wanna be our keeper of the poisonous plant? This is an inspiration because here's one man who said, no, 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 there's a better way of doing it. And uh, no, it, you know, it has to be understood that he, he gradually learned it. It evolved with him. But he's still like one of the singular examples on the entire northwest coast of one man who did something different. Who didn't follow the pack and say, oh, well, I've got this uh, 138 acres because that's what Wildwood once was. And I think I'll clear cut it and make all my money and then maybe go live in the city or something. No, 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 that's, he, he didn't think that way. So people thought he was crazy. They used to call him at the VIU forestry, uh, um, Faculty a kook or one of one of the foresters there did. I've always loved to tackle something that somebody says you can't do it and show them how what stupid fools they are by doing it. If you let Mother Nature uh, have her way, she will do it all for you. And I think that's what one of the things that Merv showed us and something that we need to take to heart. It's a coastal Douglas fir forest. Uh, and, uh, and this spot in particular has uh, a number of old growth trees mixed with second growth trees and you can really get a sense of the trajectory of this forest over the last four or five hundred years. I find that fascinating to look at how indigenous fires would have shaped the composition and structure of the forest and then how when fire uh, was suppressed how that changed the composition of the forest and allowed cedar and um, other young trees of Douglas fir and Grand fir to get established and then um, how Merv selected and shaped the structure of the forest um, and then you can start to contemplate you know what that would have done for pollinators and birds and insects and so forth so um, there's a quite a story here and it's always uh, interesting to try and unravel pieces of that. All winter now these seeds will germinate and this anthill will be green by springtime. You get a little bit of chickweed, an ant, make a little roll, and the sweet and sour, nice combination. So if you'd like, um, you can grab an ant and grab some chickweed and have a little taste. A little appetizer before the pit cook. are in the territory of Tsumenos First Nation and uh, the other Coast Salish, Snunemuch and the Cowichan peoples uh, 
their territory is all around here and their life ways are really important to this landscape. Grandfur? Grandfur generally flatter. Generally. That's right. All around. Yes. The annual pet cook uh, is more than just a cooking event. Uh, this is uh, Nancy Turner, uh, Professor Emeritus of Ethnobotany, uh, taking us into the forest and uh, foraging for salal and ferns and using them along with some very lovely wild salmon that has been donated and root vegetables to create a feast for all our friends who have uh, so wonderfully donated and hung in with us as we uh, repurchased wild root. I first learned how to do uh, pit cooking from a wonderful elder from the Pachidat Nation, Ida Jones. Now, I don't know if you can see how the rocks are sparking, but that, uh, that means they're really, really hot. We learned about pit cooking and then we experimented under her guidance. And the first time we did it was at the beach there at Port Renfrew and everything was pretty raw. Because of the difference in cooking in sand versus cooking in clay, you have to know how much water to add, how hot to make the rocks, how many rocks, and all of those things. So it takes a lot of knowledge and experience to do the pit cooking properly. But Ida remembered as a girl when they actually still harvested and used the traditional root vegetables. So the springbank clover, Pacific silverweed roots, and camas bulbs. She remembered how those were done, and they were separated in layers as they cooked and then you can take them out and you can press them into cakes or chop them up and dry them. And that's uh, what you would store for winter and you'd also use as a valued trade good. You have a, a post that goes right down to the bottom and when you finish building it, you pull that post out and you pour water in the channel that it leaves and it goes down and hits the red hot rocks at the bottom of the pit and generates clouds of steam. And so that's what's going to cook the food. Sometimes if you're cooking clams, you want to put kelp in there instead of uh, salal. And uh, up in the interior, people use fireweed, they use wild strawberry, they use rose branches, they use Douglas fir branches. Just depends on what you have available and what is your traditional way of using the vegetation in the cooking pits. <laughs> okay. Now dirt. As everyone stand around the edges. Wait the tarp down. Wait the tarp down. Around the edges. Yeah, the outside first. Vegetables are ideal, but you can cook. Also apples, you can cook corn on the cob. And you can cook salmon and clams and seafood of various kinds. You have to quickly cover the pit. Originally it would be with cedar mats or cattail mats, and now we use canvas or burlap. And then you put dirt over that until there's no steam escaping at all. And the steam is circulating around the food through the vegetation, flavoring the food and cooking it at the same time. It's sort of a combination of steaming, smoking and baking. Incredible experience we've had. Nancy is a uh, world-renowned ethnobotanist. She travels around the world and yet she makes some time come down to Wildwood here and uh, and support our board and actually put on these big cooks, do the tours. Um, yeah, fantastic resource. Douglas fir, trailing blackberry, and there's some grand fir I think buried in here somewhere too. So we'll mix all of that up. We wanted to pay tribute to all the people who have contributed their work and their expertise and their enthusiasm to support Wildwood. So Nancy the Bannock, what consistency do you add oh, uh, the moisture? Do you knead it at all or just that looks press it right. and, and then, then wrap it on a stick? Yeah, it wants to cook it. You can. Yeah, perfect. It's made with different things, but mostly it's just flour and uh, some form of 
rising like baking powder in this case. You can make sourdough bannock. We call it the spirit of place, where it informs you and you connect with it. And, and when you connect with a piece of ground like Wildwood, you feel the connections. And so it speaks to you. And so it spoke to Merv and Merv spoke to us and some of us listened. We can learn from those historic practices in terms of trying to manipulate the way biomass is distributed so that there's more resiliency. And I think that's the lesson I would take both from Indigenous people's uh, practices as well as from Merv. His, his goal was to see how humans can coexist on the land. We can make a, a little dish from the leaves by just by doing that. You can do thimble berries that way too. But if you need a little berry container, it, it's easy to make one just with the stem and the leaf together. We still sustainably harvest logs. Uh, we do the value add here on the property. We have a mill and we build from our own lumber. And that's a program that we hope to develop in the coming years. There's all sorts of ways of benefiting from the forest without having to destroy it, and that's really our prime motivation. Over time, we're probably harvesting um, as much and in a more ecologically uh, sensitive way. In other words, the idea behind that is to maintain ecological integrity, ecological services, at the same time looking at what you can without damaging a natural uh, environment, which you can take off the land. The first thing is to take the soil off the top, as much as possible. It doesn't have to be all taken off. Thank you to the Creator for providing us with this opportunity to be together and enjoy food. That's great. OK, well, no, that's perfect. <laughs> this is just a tiny, tiny piece of what should have been a much larger intact ecosystem. In fact, the Douglas fir ecosystem, there is less than 0.5% remaining unloved. Now, think about that. That's not very much. And so it's an inspiration in that there was a different way we could have done it. We didn't do it, now we have to practice what's called restoration forestry. And that's the next thing we have to move into. And we have to get inspired like Merv did, and we have to inspire others. And what we're going to do is to lift out the different food and put it into the containers. Salmon are stuffed with uh, native, the native blue elderberries oh, and <laughs> native crab apples, thanks to Jay. It really is a, um, an interesting traditional method of, of First Nations cooking. We try and have a, a celebration of this a couple times a year. It's always really well attended. People really enjoy this type of cultural event. Garlics and onions and beets and carrots. Yummy. <laughs> Just melts in your mouth, doesn't it? It's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's like the flavour of all of the herbs and spices and the wood and yeah, everything. So, yeah, yeah, really good. Incredible. I think it's wonderful. It tastes very unique. It's got um, a smoky, pungent taste, but yeah, roasted and it's yeah, wonderful. It's the first time I've been to a pit cook, and I was pleasantly surprised at how easy it was to cook despite needing. Like 12 people, um, but how good the food was afterwards, it's, it, was, it was awesome, it was really awesome. And the salmon was top draw. There are so many inherent values that nature provides us that costs us 
you know, millions of dollars to reproduce those water filtration systems and all of the other benefits that nature provides us. So uh, this is a really incredible opportunity to, to share um, the values of the forest with, with uh, the general public, with academics, with professionals. Now I have this deep appreciation because I can see the interrelationship and how these trees can communicate with one another through the mycelial network. We're just beginning to learn these things after we cut most of our old growth. Climate change is certainly showing us that uh, our environment is changing around us. And an eco-forest actually is a model of how the forest protects itself from uh, natural disasters, fire, arid conditions. And these are the things that we need to learn and observe how the forest is doing this. The upper canopy, the mid zone, and the floor of the forest, how the entire forest works together to protect itself. So we watch our cedar and our hemlock, particularly on this property. The cedar is beginning a die off in the sort of more challenging areas with cedar, a little higher up, a little less moisture, a little rockier soil. Um, but what we're also noticing is that some of our dug fir saplings, again, on more challenged sites are beginning to die off. So yeah, we're getting early signs of, of climate change here, as indicated by these two sort of um, species we monitor fairly carefully. I've always said the best thing that we could ever do to combat climate change is to plant more trees and to grow more plants everywhere because plants are the original solar panels, right? The plants are the ones that use the carbon dioxide. They're the ones that produce oxygen. They use the energy from the sun and they convert that energy into chemical energy that all of us depend on. And we need to reverse the deforestation that's happening and just continue to grow and grow and uh, steward more and more forests all around the world. When you're doing something like watershed planning or looking at uh, biodiversity, when you're looking at climate change, you have to account for the impact of industrial forestry in that. It's not saying that industrial forestry is bad. Uh, we have some of the best fiber farmers in the world here. But it is saying that there is an ecological implication of the kind of management they're doing. This property is uh, a symbol of what we can do in, in terms of uh, particularly private woodlots. Um, this is a, an excellent example of how people in the area here can learn uh, and, and people from all over the world learn to manage their own woodlots. Uh, and we hope then to eventually share this information with, with the forest industry, you know, the commercial industry, and for them to learn that a monoculture uh, reforesting is, is not viable in the long run. Um, so we hope again this to be a, a learning center uh, and a place where we can come together with the forest industry uh, and people who are looking at the environmental aspects of the forest and come together and, and learn from each other. Don't go about it saying we can't do it. That's, a, that's where our loggers and companies are falling down. Oh no, we can't do that. They've never tried it. How in hell's bells do they know what they can do with it? They want it right today and they want as much of it as they can get all at once. All of us who are with the Ecoforestry Institute Society um, we've been touched by Merv and his teachings over the years and our society stepped in, borrowed money and purchased this land so that it would continue not to be owned by us, not to be owned by anyone, to own itself and to be here for all the generations to come. <laughs>